here this morning. Uh, just a few quick announcements. We will have kids group this afternoon at the normal time. Uh, we still need volunteers uh, in the nursery, so if you'd be able to help, please let me know uh, to teach uh, the kids as well for Sunday school. Uh, join us for Wednesday night Bible study. We'll be coming back here again this week. We'll be looking at the sixth commandment. Now, if you notice, uh, last week I said that we were going to have a yard sale on October the 16th. We decided to move that back a little bit to uh, um, the first Saturday in November. So on November the 6th, we will be having that community yard sale. Again, I've heard from multiple folks um, about different items, which is great. Um, if you need to get into the church or help with these items, please let me know. I'll be glad to help wherever I can. Um, and so we can we'll have a little bit of time to collect all those to have a yard sale to try to fix the front porch. Um, so if you've got anything, you know anybody, please let me know. Also, just to, so you are all aware, next Sunday we will have communion. It's Worldwide Communion Day. So uh, please come together as we celebrate the sacrament that God has given us. But other than that, that is all the announcements I have for us today. And so as we come together to, to worship the Lord, let us now hear our call to worship from Psalm 47, verses 1 and 2. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. The Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great King over all the earth. Let's pray together. Our gracious and mighty God, we come before you today. We thank you for the ability to get up this morning, to come here today to worship you, our Maker and our Savior. Lord, today may we have gathered not simply out of routine, but Lord, out of love. You, O oh God, have called us to be your people, to be your church. And Lord, today may our hearts be tuned to you. Help us to give you the praise, the honor, the glory here this morning in our prayers, in our songs, in the hearing and receiving of your word. Lord, today may you be glorified. And may you help us who have gathered here today be focused upon you. May this be a time of worship and a time of rest and a time of equipping as we go out this week to honor you in this world. So be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite everyone to stand together. Our first hymn is number 332, Lead On, O King Eternal.
seated. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Psalms, from the longest chapter in the Bible, in Psalm number 119. And so our first lesson is Psalm 119, verse 9 through 16. Hear now God's word. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. God's word for God's people. Amen. And let us pray. Everlasting God, we come before you today. What is the people that you have saved by your word? Not those who have lived well enough to earn our salvation. Not those who have been good enough by our good deeds, but those that have seen ourselves as broken sinners in need of a Savior. And if called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved. And what a mighty and wonderful thing it is to know that when we call upon Jesus, we have been forgiven. We have been saved. We have been washed by your blood. And so, Lord, today we gather as those who have been redeemed by Christ. And we call out to you and know you hear us, you answer us, you deliver us. Lord, we gather here today having been brought from many different circumstances. For some, life is good. All seems to be going well. Your blessings are very apparent, whether our jobs, with our families. Within others of us, life is hard. Whether it be grief, exhaustion, pain. We come here today to be restored. And Lord, whatever walk of life we all might be here, Lord, may you remind us of the hope we have in you. For you bind up the broken heart. You enable us to walk worthily in your sight. You equip us in every manner to honor and glorify you daily. And Lord, as we've gathered here today, we pray this truth. Lord, may you help each one of us be a light for Jesus. No matter if our situation is good or bad. Lord, may the gospel be shown forth in our lives. And Lord, may we be seeking to share it with those around us. For Lord, as a church, we are not those that are content with our own salvation. We should want to see others come to know you as well. And Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us someone in our lives that we and show Jesus too. Give us opportunities to share the gospel with them. Give us opportunities for, to show kind words and loving actions. Not simply to say, hey, look at them, but to see the one that is in us. Lord, if we live in a dark and sinful world, and Lord, may we be those that show forth your light. It's so easy to be complacent and be content. And where we're at, Lord, may we continue to strive for you daily. So that the church will continue to grow. That we would continue to grow. Lord, may we be never okay with where we're at. May we continue to look to how we can honor you more. How we can obey you more. How we can love you more. And Lord, may we look to you for help. And help us this week to see where our shortcomings are. Help us to see how you can work in us to overcome them. Lord, may you be our rock and our redeemer, both in the life to come and in this life. And Lord, may you continue to bless our church, work in our church, that all we might do would be pleasing in your sight as individuals and as this body here in your care, at your care. And so, Lord, now we come with many things in our hearts and we take a moment to offer them to you inside. Oh, 
we have been looking in your word and seeing. We don't know what to pray. We can always pray. Prayer and talk to disciples pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I invite everyone to stand together as we come and we affirm our faith. Again, this is not simply something we do out of routine. But this is the truth about God that we believe. It should be found on page 12 of your red hymn book. So I ask the Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into heaven. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing together number 269, Jesus Calls Us. understand it here today, we know that we need your help. 
So, Lord, may your spirit open our hearts and minds this morning and help us to see what this means for us today. What this reveals to us about you and how we can apply this here in our lives. Lord, may you be with me. May my words be your words. That your people would hear you and be blessed and be equipped to go out and live for you. So, Lord, be with us now in this time and pray in Jesus' name. Again, Matthew chapter 6, the second half of verse 10. Hear now the word of the Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. How many of you have ever tried to replicate something? Maybe it was an experience you had. You and your family went on some kind of trip, and you had such a great time that the next time you go, you want to try to make the same thing happen. Or it could be something, you're visiting somebody in their house, and you see, oh, I like those benches, and they made them. Or it might be a piece of artwork on the wall or something around the house. You might say, oh, I would like to do that myself. And so you try to copy it. But I think one of the ways when we see this happening quite frequently is when it comes to food. How many of you have ever had a dish at someone's house and said, man, I've got to figure out how to make it? And you ask the person for the recipe, and hopefully they're not too stingy with you. But you want to eat it because it was really, really good. The same thing has happened in our house uh, where Amanda, uh, who loves Chick-fil-A, had an idea. As most of you know, sadly, there is not a Chick-fil-A close to yours. So you have to drive to Rock Hill in order to go get it. But, Amanda looked online and she found a recipe in order to recreate it. And so, what you do is you take the chicken and you put it in pickle juice for a while, you bread it, you throw it in the air fryer. Let me tell you, this, this pickle chicken, as we call it, uh, is spot on. It's just like the Chick-fil-A sandwich. And what makes it even better is it's less of a drive and a fraction of the cost. So if you want a recipe today, you can find my wife downstairs. And what makes it even better is they have this wonderful Chick-fil-A sauce that Walmart has replicated that you can go buy off the shelf and put it on that sandwich. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And if you think about it, in the days we live in on the internet with Google, with YouTube, we can easily find a way to recreate a dish. Something so wonderful, so good, so... Some might even call it heavenly. And speaking of heaven, we think about our scripture here today. We say something is heavenly. It's really, really good. It's perfect, right? Because when we think of heaven as the place, that's what we think of. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about heaven, but what we do know of the Bible, what the Bible does teach us, is that it's perfect. It's sin-free. There's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. We are with the Lord in His presence, enjoying Him forever. And so when we say a place that is heaven on earth, we say that it replicates that feeling. And if we think about heaven, wouldn't we want it here on earth? Not just with food, but in all facets of life. Something perfect and wonderful. Where everything is right and just. But sadly, many people try to do that and go about it the completely wrong way. Many people want a utopia here in the world and they say we can, we can get there if we only get rid of corrupt government. Or if we can get rid of poverty. Or if we can get rid of violence. And it's noble to think of these things, but at the end of the day, these are the wrong solutions. Because if we want heaven here on earth, what we need is found in our prayer here this morning. If we want to replicate heaven just like we do with the Chick-fil-A recipe, we find that we need to pray. We need to pray as we see this petition that God's will would be done on earth just as it is in heaven. That we would see people obey Him perfectly here in the world just like the angels do in heaven. And what a wonderful place the world would be if people would do that. But there's a problem that gets in the way, isn't there? A three-letter word we don't like to hear, sin. 
it infects everything. It affects all of us. As good as we might want to be, we are tempted daily. But that's why we pray this petition here. We pray that God would help us as believers to do His will. As well as that He would help those in the world who are right now living against Him to come to know Him and to follow His will as well. That they would obey Him perfectly, readily, and willingly. And through that thing, we might have a foretaste, a recreation of heaven here on earth. And so that is why we pray this here. But here's the question we must begin. If we pray for God's will to be done, what does doing God's will look like in our life? Well, I think the best place to start is with our hearts. If you want to do God's will, if you've been praying this Lord's Prayer, what that means is your life's central focus must change. When we pray this, we pray that God will allow a shift to happen in our hearts so that whereas first we have been putting ourselves as the center, we would now replace it with the Lord, that He would be the center of our life. Often, sadly, when we pray, instead of praying, Your will be done, we pray, My will be done. Think about how many times we bow our head in prayer and ask for what we want. God, let me... Get this job that I really, really want. It's got great benefits. It pays well, Lord. Give it to me. Or, God, let me marry this girl that I really, really like. God, give me this nice long life with all of this wonderful stuff. And our prayers stay like that. Now, I'm not saying you can't ask God for these things. There's nothing wrong with me wanting a job. There's nothing wrong with a, a, a person that you truly like, that you would like to see a future with. There's nothing wrong with asking God to have good health and you know, a good uh, home life. But the truth of this is, is that we ask all these things not because we are the same. We ask these things, as 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, according to the will of God. It reminds us that God will give us what we ask if we ask according to His will. And what that means is, yes, you can ask for these things, but if God does not answer your prayers the way you want, it's certainly okay. Because He knows what's best. Because if we think about our prayers, we have to ask ourselves, is it about me or is it about you? When you pray to God for that shiny red sports car, are you really asking for His will there? I think if we look at our prayers at times, we'll say, no, we're, we're asking more for what we want than what He wants. I think that's why it's so hard, because we are so used to having ourselves at the center of everything. And it's really difficult to put God there instead. I mean, we, think about the day and age we live in. You know, we, we live in the age of identity politics. The age of the individual. It's no longer about the group anymore. It's about me. My wants, my needs come first. That's where we get this whole mantra of you do you. It doesn't what matter about other people. You do what you want to do in this life. And so often we want the things that we want. We want things to go according to our plan. We want our way. We want our destiny. We become the sinner. And we only want to do God's will then. When it lines up with our own. When we get something. You have a prayer that God, if you give me this, then I'll live for you. Who's at the center? We have to be careful that we're not just doing it to see what we want. There's a story about an old Scottish woman uh, who she would go around the countryside from home to home and she would sell thread and buttons uh, and shoestrings and when she would come to an unmarked crossroads that she didn't know which way to go, she would take a stick, throw it up in the air, and then wherever the stick pointed, she would go that route. Well, one day, somebody saw her throwing a stick up in the air repeatedly. And they asked her you know, why she was doing that more than once. And she said, well, because it keeps pointing to the left, and I want to take the road to the right. So then, dutifully, she continued to throw it up time and time again until it finally pointed the way that she wanted 
I think in our prayers we can sometimes be like that. Can't we? But our focus instead of ourselves should be on what God wants in our lives. Doing His will. And as hard as that might be, we've got to do it. It might be in your life. You might have to pass up an opportunity to get ahead in your company. Because the way that you get there is by means that God will not be fine. It might be hard that you want to lash out in anger at someone who has insulted you or slandered you or a family member. But we know that's not what God would want you. It might be difficult to use your finances to help somebody in need so that you don't have near as much money for the, the new item you want to buy yourself. In the world that we live in and how hard it might be, we have to give up our comfort, maybe what we want, to stand up for God's truth, even when it's uncomfortable. Not giving in to peer pressure, although everybody else is doing it. They might make fun of you for it. We want to follow God, not necessarily get what we want out of it. And that's hard, isn't it? Whether you're a teenager, whether you're seasoned in age, wherever you are in life, it's hard for us to want to do God's will above our own. But I want you to think of Jesus for a second. We all remember the story. The night that he's arrested there in the garden of Gethsemane. He's sitting there, he's praying to the Father and saying, Lord, remove this cup of wrath. But yet he knows that the only way for us to be saved through his suffering and his death. And if you notice, Jesus doesn't say, well, that's not what I want. He doesn't hightail it out of the garden, does he? No. He's, he prays that it's not his will, but your will be done. And so must we. If Jesus can go to the cross and die for you, then you too can seek the Lord and his will. Even if it hurts, even if it's hard, even if it's possible. Because as Christians, as we pray this prayer, we're not so worried about what we want, but what the Lord wants instead. And so that, that is where our heart must be when we pray this petition here that God's will would be done. But when we think about God's will, okay, that's our heart. But what exactly is God's will that we're praying for to be done? Well, there's two sides of this, and we'll cover those at least these final two points. And the first of those is that when we pray this, we are praying, praying that God's plan would come to pass. That as Ephesians 1, 9, and 10 say, that God would make known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. Well, that saying is that God's plan for all of history will come to pass. Because it reminds us that God is in control. He is sovereign. He is over all things. And from the very creation of the world until the end of the world, when Jesus comes again, God has a plan that has been laid out. And nothing can deter that plan, thankfully. And so there's where the assurance we have, that if we put our faith in Jesus, it all will end well. And we're okay with the final end, but so much that the day-to-day, -day, oh, we struggle with that a little bit, don't we? We become impatient. Because we want to know what's going to happen tomorrow, don't we? There's this story about a man. He grew up uh, as a farmer. And he was okay with that, but he just kind of felt like maybe he should be doing something different in life. And he's out laying in the field one day. And he looks up in the, in the clouds with the letter P and C. And he thinks, oh, I need to preach Christ. And so he goes out and he gets into ministry. But it turns out he is one of the worst preachers that anyone had ever listened to. And I mean, he was bad. And the congregation, they loved him through it. But there was one day that one of the, the parishioners came up to him and said, Pastor, why did you think you were called into ministry? And so the pastor told them that story about the clouds and thinking, Pastor, don't you think you might have just forced what you wanted and not thought about God's plan? Because maybe that P and that C in the cloud didn't stand for preach Christ. Maybe plant corn. 
But sometimes we want something different. We want to know what's going to happen next, so we try to force God's hand. That's where people come up with these things like palm readings and fortune telling, astrology, because we want to know the future. And sometimes when we try to get ahead of God, we end up messing things up. But we have to remember that God, He's got a plan that's laid out. And He knows what's going to happen because everything happens according to His will. That's not just a fact. That also encourages us that we pray these things. When we pray, your will be done. We are acknowledging that, God, you have a plan. It's going to get worked out. And even if I don't understand what's going on, I know that everything happens for a reason and for my good. That's why Job didn't curse God and die, even though everything was going wrong in his life. And that's why you and I can trust the Lord when we don't know what tomorrow might hold, even though our... Days might be going through many, many hardships when things don't go the way we plan. We can know it's all going to be okay because everything is working out according to God's purpose. And what is God's purpose? As much as we like, the world likes to think, well, God's purpose is to make me happy. It's not. His purpose in this world is to glorify Christ. All that happens to you, all that happens to me, all that happens in all of history has the purpose of exalting the Lord Jesus. I mean, if you think about the Bible for a second, one of the things I've been trying to hammer in your head since I've got here is the whole Bible points us to Jesus. If you look back in the, in the Garden of Eden, we see when, when Adam and Eve fell, we see Jesus there in the need for a redeemer. And the Old Testament we see as God gathers his people together. He points them forward to the coming Messiah, the coming Savior. We see in the Gospels when the Lord Jesus comes into the world, dies on the cross, and rises again so that all who believe would find salvation. In the epistles, we see the greatness of Jesus and how we ought to live to honor Him. And in Revelation, we find the hope of His coming again. And all of us. And so as we see in the Scriptures, God is working out His will. Glorify Christ. And the same thing is true day in and day out in our lives. And He is working out that same will. And so we who know where His plan is going in the end, pray this so that we would be content wherever God will lead us. But are we? How often do we grumble? How often do we complain? We're like the Israelites in the desert complaining about the manner that God's given them. You know, just, just think about the weather for a second. Now, these last few days have been wonderful. I love this weather. And, you know, you think about a nice sunny day like this. We're very thankful for God for the, the, glory, the good weather. and So we can go to that ball game, that concert. We can go out and do this, that, and the other. But how quickly do we complain if it starts to rain? I can't do what I want to do. A game got canceled. I can't go here. I can't do that. I can't work in the yard like I wanted to. So we just sit there miserable. But if remember God's in control. What if that rain is to water the ground that really needs it? What if that rain is to keep someone who would have had an accident in their home? What if that rain is to keep that mom or that dad who has been distant from their family going to and fro in the house to actually spend time together? What if that rain is simply to teach you patience? We're so quick when things don't go our way to, to get mad at God. I think God's cheating us. But as Christians, we understand God has a reason for everything that happens. The good things and the bad things. The things that inconvenience us. The things that, that give us difficulty. Everything. You know, if you look at your life and, and go back, you can see when something bad has happened, how God has brought you through. How you're better off for, uh, because of how you learn from it. It reminds us of Jesus again. Think about it. Jesus suffered that awful, terrible death on the cross. He was beaten. He was suffered. He had that crown of thorns shoved on his head. And then he ended up dying on the cross. That's an awful thing. But through that awful thing came one of the most wonderful things. Our salvation. Because because Jesus died, our sins have been paid for. And because He rose again, if you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you have an assurance 
That yes, even though your life might have problems, it might have pain, it might have things that you don't like, or things that don't go according to your plan, you can know the end. And you can know that God is working out that whole plan for your good as His child. And so that's why we can pray that God will be done. Because we know that as God's plan works out, it's getting us there to that end. For we and all who call upon His name will be with Him forever. But until that end comes, what must we then be doing? But we must be seeking to obey God's will in our lives. Not only are we to be content with His secret will, or that grand plan and purpose we just talked about, but we are also called to obey His revealed will, to obey what He has given to us in His Word. You see, this is that part, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we want everyone in the world to follow after Jesus, just as the angels do in heavenly perfectly. We pray that God would use us according to His will, for His purpose, by helping us to honor Him, to obey Him like we should. That God would help us, that we would stop rebelling, that we would stop resisting, and stop hesitating to follow Him. And I hope that you have that drive to follow God's will in your life. But there's a caveat to that. If you want to do God's will in your life, you've got to know God's will. You've got to open up the Bible and see what it is. And so often many people say, well, I have a feeling God wants me to do this in my life. It goes back to that me-centered and not God-centered. And we're not checking to see what God's word says if what we are doing is right or wrong. If he really wants us to do that or not. So often we have this gut feeling, but our gut, as many of us probably have seen, can lead us in the wrong direction. And that's why we must open up God's word to see what his will is, to see how we ought to live it. Because if we don't, if we just go with our gut, we end up like a woman named Jessica Hahn. Now, some of you may remember this name with uh, the whole PTL scandal and... Uh, Jim Baker and all that stuff. But this woman, she had said that she had an interview approaching and she had a gut feeling that God would really want her to go do that interview. Well, that interview was with Playboy and included topless pictures. Now, if she would have just opened up the Bible and looked at God's word and say commandment number seven, she would have seen, no, God doesn't want me to do that. And that's why it's so important for us if we want to seek God's will in our life, we've got to know His Word. We've got to spend time in it. We've got to spend time with Him. So that God will help us to do it. Just like we saw in that first scripture lesson, we should want to know God's commands. We should want God's Word to be stored up in our hearts. That we would seek Him fully each and every day. And that we would not want to wander from His commands. And so that's why we pray again that God would help us to do His will, to know His Word, and then to help us do it in our lives. Because we might know Jesus. We might know our Bible. But in the end, we're not perfect. As much as we probably all wish we came to faith, we would be perfect in this world. We all know that we're not. And we won't be perfect on this side of heaven. And that's why we pray here that God's will would be done in us. That he would work in us and help us to follow him more and more. We pray that he would remove our weaknesses. How many of you have weaknesses right now when it comes to doing God's will? All of us. It might be different areas of life, but all of us struggle. All of us have temptations that we constantly fall into, that we constantly give in to that we struggle with. And sometimes I know that even in my own life I've seen that there are times I just want to give up because it's so hard that sin just keeps coming back and back and back and won't leave me alone. But you see, that's why this prayer is an encouragement for us today. Because you can pray for God to help you do His will. And the wonderful thing is, is He will. 
Now it's going to be a process. It's not going to happen overnight as much as we'd like that to happen. But the more that you lean on God, the more that you spend time in His Word, the more that you actively seek to do His will in your life, He, by His Spirit, is going to help you do it more and more. And that's why we shouldn't be afraid to say, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I need you to help me. You know, often there are times when people... Uh, like in our neighborhood and stuff, have a project uh, around the house, and um, I volunteer to help. Um, and there are times when I have no idea what I'm doing. But what I do tell them is, hey, I can be a helping hand if you tell me what to do. Sometimes it might be holding something, it might be digging a hole, or whatever. I offer to help where I can, and then hopefully I learn something in the process. The same is true here with us doing God's work. But we say, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, but you do. Lord, I'm not good at it, but you are. Use me, or give me, help me to do it. And we find that as we continue to pray this way, and as God works in us, He then teaches us more and more about His will along the way and how to keep it. You see, that's the Christian attitude. Not a live however I please. It's a, what can I do for you? For? If you call yourself a Christian, is this your attitude? Are you seeking God's will in your life, in all of your life? Or is it still about you? And if we want this world to be a better place, it starts with us and our desire to follow Jesus every single day. You can pray this prayer when you come and worship every single Sunday. But you also have to meet. The brother has got to meet the road. As you pray to do God's will, it means you actually go out and do it. Not just on Sunday, but the other six days of the week too. Because it's easy to be half-hearted. It's easy to be lukewarm Christians. But this petition here reminds us that we need to see where our hearts truly lie. That our focus is no longer about us, it's about the Lord. Life is no longer about what I will, it's about what God wants. And the wonderful thing about this is that it's also a reminder that God is in control. That as His will is done in the world, if you pray this, you can be content and you can be assured that whatever going on in your life is a part of God's plan. That if you have put your trust in Him, that it's all working out in the end for your good eternal. But as we leave this morning, I want to challenge each one of you from this verse. It reminds us that we have got to stop being so complacent. We have got to stop being so okay with where I'm at, but instead want to continue to grow. Want to continue to know God's will more and more each day, and then to do it in every single part of your life. That's my challenge to you over the this morning. How can you better do God's will? And the good thing is, as I said earlier, He will help you do it. But as we pray it, we've got to have the same desire each and every day. And the wonderful thing about this is if we are seeking God's will to be done, our hearts are focused upon Him, we see His grand plan, and we seek to do His will in our lives. And hopefully, the Lord will use us as His church to keep spreading the gospel. Our hearts will continue to change more and more so that all the world will see Him in His will and seek to do His will. But just like in heaven, we can have a little bit of heaven in our Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank You. We thank You for who You are as the, the Maker and the Sustainer of all things, as the One who has laid out His grand plan. And Lord, I pray today that You would help each one of us to do Your will. Lord, help us to have a heart for You and a desire to live for You in our lives. Help us to be content with Your plan and where we are at. And Lord, may we use the circumstances that you have put us in for your glory. 
Lord, help us to see our hearts and to see where we fall short. Help us to honor you more and more. Help us to see how we can serve you, how we can do your will in whatever parts of our life it might be. Lord, the wonderful thing about your will is that it will be done. And so, Lord, today we pray that it will be done in us. As your church, as your people, may you use us to go out in this world, share the gospel, that they too may do your will. Or that your name will be glorified and honored in all the ends of this world. And so, Lord, help us this week go forth to honor you, to glorify you, to do your will in all things. We pray this name in Christ's holy name. Amen. I invite everyone to stand together. Our final hymn this morning is number 496, Jesus Shall Reign Where Heir the Son.